and welcome back, everybody, to the TV show podcast. I'm Jay Black, joined every week by Rhea Hughes and the very bug-eyed Angela Catali there for just a moment. Wow, that, that is a scary sight, everybody. If you're not viewing this on YouTube. Feldman look. Yeah, that's it. Some Marty Feldman eyes. I dig that. So much to get to this week, guys. And Rhea, I don't want to not include you in this because I know you're not a fan of Curb. But Angela and I, we talked about it. You want to know how much we love TV? We talked about this for 20 minutes yesterday off air because we were both so excited about it. So I'm just going to clear out of your way, Angelo. What did you think of the Curb finale that aired on Sunday? Well, I was trying to show you how I'm still glowing. <laughs> I didn't want, you know, even though I'm retired, I still go to bed early. So I didn't see it till Monday. And, um, the finale of Curb Your Enthusiasm, I cannot make this proclamation the same week it came out, but it will probably be regarded, at least by me, as the greatest finale in the history of television. Wow. Better than uh, MASH, better than Cheers, better than Seinfeld, all right? Because what Larry David did in this finale, he doubled that on the format of a finale for Seinfeld that was roundly rejected by everyone. Yep. And he went, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> and I'm going to prove to you that it is a good way to end the series. And then I'm going to give you a twist that makes you wonder if you, if I wasn't right about the Seinfeld finale. And that's what it did. Same format brought back all the people that were victims of Larry's stupid behavior. Yep. And then, He's back in the cell at the end. He's doing the tent, the pants tent thing <laughs> that he did in the first episode, just the way they did it, Seinfeld. And then Jerry Seinfeld shows up. And I don't want to give it away. I'll just say that at that point, what happened from that point to the very end was one of the most brilliant things I've ever seen in television. Yeah. And it has left me on a high for two days and counting. It was not only... Probably the best finale I've ever seen. It made me rethink a finale I hated. And now I'm wondering if we weren't all way too harsh on the Seinfeld finale. Well, you know for a fact, I was down with the Seinfeld finale right. before it was cool. I liked it. But I'm going to say this. Only Larry David could have done this. And oh. only Larry David would have the stupid obstinacy to do the same finale twice. Anybody else... If I had a joke that failed on my big television debut, like if I was on HBO and I, I ended on a joke and everybody said, what a great special, but that last joke sucked. I would not do a rehash of that joke on my second one. Only Larry David could do that. And you're right, Angelo. It redeemed the end of Seinfeld. It and that's, did. That's what I'm reading it's about. It's amazing. Rhea, did you get to see it? No, I, I just, I text Jay like a couple minutes before our show. And I said, I did watch like the last 10 minutes. So I saw the courtroom scene and Seinfeld, which I love. And it appears Seinfeld has become a much better actor over these many years <laughs> yeah, since, you're right. since Seinfeld. <laughs> you're right. And I will say, yeah, he may have redone it, but here's the what the difference is Larry did in this one. It was actually funny. Yeah, <laughs> really it's funny. So that's I la I was laughing out loud while I was I, I went that's brilliant because I was a devotee of Seinfeld. I watched every single episode. I probably had fifteen people over my house for the finale. We love you know we hated it, but we loved the show. But I thought it was really funny. The, it, it, can, can I just take a moment, moment to the, the okay. key moment is when Larry looks at Jerry, and he goes, "Oh my God." This is how we should have ended the Seinfeld. Yeah. He doesn't say Seinfeld, but he, you know, and it was like, wow, now yeah. that, and then they have the last scene in the plane. I mean, that is just pure genius. It's pure genius. This tops the new heart dream sequence. Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. The second new heart show. This is better than that. It's similar in that it's the twist of twists. I'm sorry, anybody that didn't appreciate the brilliance of that doesn't love television. No. Because it was great. It Can was. we just take a moment to talk about Seinfeld? I thought he was kind of a revelation through this yeah. episode. Yeah. Uh, the, the format of the semi-improvised, just chilling with your friends, talking about stuff that you find funny, right. so more fit him 
than the sort of rehearsed scenes of Seinfeld. It was right. almost like this was the show that Seinfeld should have been, even though Seinfeld yeah. was great. Don't get me wrong. No, but it Seinfeld was, was he, great. It, it, Seinfeld was better than Curb. I, I'll still argue that. Ultimately I mean, speaking, you're you probably five, right. Because I know you were going to say, where are you going to put it now? Yeah. Where do you put Curb now? I'm going to put it five. Okay. I think there are four oh, wow. back. Yeah. All right. Seinfeld is the best sitcom I ever saw. I can watch episodes that I've seen five times and still love them. Yeah. I can't say that about anyone else. Closest to it is second, Honeymooners. Wow. Third, okay. Larry Sanders. Just an amazing show. Totally underrated in the, the innovations it brought. Yeah. Cheers to me was fourth and Curb is fifth. And Sonny, it's always Sonny in Philadelphia, is right behind uh, uh, Curb. I think Larry David is the funniest man in television history. Well, I mean, I'm just going to say, Larry is a co-creator of two of the top five yeah. shows on your list. So do we yeah. do we put him up there with like Norman Lear? Yes. Is he, is he a uh, all-time great? Not as prolific as Lear. Lear did way more, right. but less political. So to me, yeah. more relatable. Because the things that Larry deals with is things we deal with every day. And often he gives voice to things we think, but would never say. So <laughs> but advantage to me, advantage Larry David. Yeah, he uh, it was a, a great episode. I know, Rhea, you are not a uh, Curb fan. Yeah. But I wanted to talk to you about that because I was just thinking it brought up the idea of like, do you see it as a cultural blind spot for you? Like when we talk about it, like, are you like, oh, I should really know more about this? Or are you more like, I tried it, not my speed, I'm good. Because I have a well, few blind spots myself. Yeah, well, so like I, I, here's the difference is I did try Curb Your Enthusiasm and I just didn't care for it. Much like Succession, which I am going to watch before the year is out. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but you know, I, I gave it a try and, and I just realized it wasn't for me. Probably a cultural blind spot is Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. which I've never watched. And I, I mean, that's all sure. anybody talks about. Yeah, and, and the new morning show I'm on, they're all... They not only yeah. watch it, they've read the, the is it George L. Martin, the book? George R.R. Yeah. Martin. I've read all R. those R. books Martin. too, Rhea. You'd be surprised yeah. to know. Yeah. I'm just not into dragons. Yeah. I really just think it boils it. down into, if it's not How to Train Your Dragon, which is a great movie franchise, which right. I've watched with my son throughout the years. I just, I've never been into that kind of genre. So that is it for me. But are you are you against cringe humor? You know, really yeah, I don't like stuff. Well, see, here's the crazy thing is I don't like awkward humor, Jay. Right. And I worked with the most awkward person <laughs> in the history of mankind for 26 you years. You would have thought I have. Maybe that's why I was like, I get enough of this at work four hours a day. I just can't possibly bring myself no. to watch it. I just see yeah, I didn't care for it. Leah, my wife didn't think that much of the finale. And I said really? and, and she said to me, she said this. I live this every day. This isn't anything that different. <laughs> Hey. And I and I I took it as an incredible compliment since I consider Larry David a genius. <laughs> would, would you say, Angela? This I, I something I heard on a different podcast was that the tenor of the show changed after he had that long delay. Remember, he was off for like four years, right. and then he came back. And I would say, Rhea, the later episodes of Curb are not built on the extreme cringe as okay. much as the earlier seasons were. The earlier seasons went pretty hard sometimes. I think yeah. the later seasons, it's more Larry hanging out with his friends and truly enjoying himself. Would you agree with that, Angelo? Or do you think it's no, just I, I way totally through? disagree with it. I binged it um, like six months ago, the whole thing. And um, it was cringy the whole way. <laughs> and I thought the last season, which I thought was the best season, Right. was the cringy. I mean, it was one thing after another. He would get in situations three and four times in the same show. And it was, no, I, I think it's just like the finale. He doubled down on all of it. He went, this is my humor. Take it or leave it. Yeah. And as Rhea just pointed out, as an incredibly awkward social person myself, I love this stuff. Yeah. I can't, and you got to understand, we work with Al Morgan. Yeah. There, he wouldn't be able to watch five minutes of that. No, right. he hated it. He hated it. it. He yeah. hated that kind of stuff. But to me, it's one of the best forms of humor. I think it's fantastic. So two more points before we move off of this. Uh, speaking in a global sense, because Larry David, 
has more fu money than just about anybody. I mean, Seinfeld just crossed over into the billionaire territory. He's yeah. got to be close to a billionaire. Um, and a, by all accounts, he just told HBO, "I'm doing my show. If you want yeah. it, you can air it. If you don't want it, I'm not going to do the show." And I, I was wondering the success of this. Is that singular to a mind like Larry David? Or is this something that more people should do? The worry is if you give more creative freedom, you wind up with something like The Curse or Bupkiss. Um, but, you know, the, the good side of it is you get something like Curb. Rhea, do you think there should be more creative freedom or is it just geniuses get free reign and, and they can do whatever they want? Well, so I think here's the innate difference between, you know, Curb Your Enthusiasm and a guy like Larry David, who is a creative genius. And I'm sure works really hard at it. Bupkis did not appear to have like anything really well scripted. Nothing. Based off the first scene, which Angela and I will never get over with um, <laughs> what's her name? Uh, Falco. Eddie Falco, um, yeah. yeah. Eddie Falco. Oh. So, you know, that there's a difference between, you know, being a creative. If you are a creative genius, you live with those warts. Right. Because you will be successful as long as they also have a work ethic. So I think that's where the difference is. I have gotcha. nothing to add. I think Rhea said it perfectly. That should be sent out on like a, a tablet. <laughs> that's exactly right. A genius can do it. Uh, Pete Davidson is not a genius. He is Correct. Not, that's a good all point. he would do is what he did, a piece of garbage. Yeah. And I'll just, yeah. I'll just end out on this note. Angela, I like to think of this podcast as your Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> because oh, you had this legendary run on your first yeah. show. And yep. now here you are with the reins off. You can do whatever you want. Right. And this is, a, and it just, it's like curb your enthusiasm, just a little cringier because you're here. That's my You would tell you, um, for 33 years, the reins were off on radio. I do whatever the hell I want. <laughs> he did do whatever he wanted. Yes. He used to call me the 800 pound gorilla. And yeah. I, love that. I was happy of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My wife calls me the 41 pound Labrador. I don't know if that counts as <laughs> counts as much. Uh, all right. So uh, last night, uh, switching gears to uh, another finale, the NCAA men's tournament, the, the ratings came out and it's shocking. I mean, it's not shocking so far as the storylines are concerned, but it's a little shocking considering what we think generally of sports. It did better uh than it did last year but it did significantly worse than the women's tournament finale now the women's tournament had a great storyline everybody was interested in it there was a lot going on that was where all the talk was but angelo you brought up the timing on this because it was what was it three o'clock sunday for right. the ncaa women's final versus 9 15 was it 9 20 9 20 on a monday night for the men's tournament. So the question is, and we were talking about this a little bit yesterday, is it more about the start time? Is it more about the storyline? What is the conventional wisdom on this and what happened, Angelo? Well, Rhea could even address this better night. Rhea, how amazing is it? Forgetting the time they, these games yeah. were played, that the women got a bigger audience than the men. It's almost well, I, unheard of. I mean, yeah. no one would have ever thought this could happen. Am I right? It is almost unheard of, but two things. And the, the time factor absolutely factored into it because I saw maybe the first 20 minutes of the game. And the only reason I've stayed up in the past 10 years, whenever they went to this 920 time, was the two times Villanova was in it because obviously I knew we were going to talk about that and who doesn't love Jay Wright. Two things. You've got Caitlin Clark. You've got Dawn Staley. Caitlin Clark, an absolute phenomenon. Everybody loves her. Everybody knows who Dawn Staley is. He's got an undefeated team and a three o'clock start. Go ahead and name me the main player on UConn. No, not the yeah. No, not the we know the one guy on Purdue, Edie, I think his name is. They, you know, for them, it was all about Danny Hurley, who is who is a show on the sidelines. I do enjoy watching him, but it was the star factor of Caitlin Clark and the three o'clock tip. I watched every single play of that game. To me, this is what the NCAA has to do. I think it would be brilliant. Have the games on. If the if the NFL can put the Super Bowl on at 620, which is watched by billions around the world, on you, they should have a championship Sunday. The women's game at 3 o'clock, the men's game at 6 o'clock. They wow. would do killer numbers. It's a great idea. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. I'll just say this, Jay. 
first of all, the fact that the women beat the men is unbelievable. Yeah. All right. Although I watched the entire women's game and didn't watch a second of the men's. And I don't have bad hours anymore like Rhea does. Yeah. <laughs> I just didn't do it. Here's the this to me exposed the biggest myth in television, in television sports. All right. The idea that you have to put games on late so that it accommodates the East Coast somewhat, although it gets yeah. real late here, and the West Coast. So if you put a game on at 9.20, 6.20 in the West Coast, people are pretty much home. 9.20 here, people haven't gone to bed yet. That's the sweet spot. Bogus. Do you understand? Yeah. Bogus. Rhea's right. The Super Bowl's the number one show. It's on at 6.30. Who was arguing about that time? It's not. Nobody. The whole way. idea that you have to accommodate the West Coast is – I'm reading a book right now, Jay, about Pete Rose. And, Pete, and it takes you through his career, and it takes you through the years that he was at the World Series, both with the Reds and with the Phillies. And the numbers they got, they literally got 50 and 60 million wow. views. Wow. All right. Wow. This is from, and those games were earlier, and in some cases, daytime. Daytime they, baseball. Three or four times more than what the World Series gets now in prime time. The I, it doesn't matter when the time is, if it's a good event, put yeah. the games where everybody is awake to see them. I'm with Rhea. I think the sweet spot might be where the Super Bowl is right now. 630. The insanity, yep. the insanity of this is what they don't learn is that they've had a great tournament. The men's tournament was great. I enjoyed, I watched a lot of the games. Yep. So did probably a lot of kids. Okay. Yeah. So now you get to the the penultimate game, the championship, and Ben Davis. We were uh, Ben Davis was on with the day. Said his nine year old goes, "Can I stay up and watch the game?" And he goes, "No, you got school yeah. the next day." So yeah. I'm, so this kid kind of watched the whole tournament all the way along. Boom, you're out for the championship. It's stupid. My my, stupid. you know, you know, Penny. She little Penny watched every yeah. second of Caitlin Clark. Watched yeah. every second of that game. Could not be awake for the men's no. tournament. And she yeah. is a sports fanatic. So agreed. Mm -hmm. Well, let's switch to what the world is a fanatic of, the British <laughs> segment that Rhea does every week. Rhea, what do you got for us this week? I've got a real, real interesting show that's actually a South African show, which does qualify because they are a commonwealth of the British Empire. So it qualifies. And it's in English, so you don't have to worry about, you know, um, you know, any kind of putting up anything on it. It's called Catch Me a Killer on BritBox via Prime. It tells the story. So it's based off uh, a book by the same name by a woman called Mickey Pistorius, South African. Angelo, you might remember Oscar, Oscar. Pistorius. Yeah. yeah. Who, you know, convicted murderer who went to jail for shooting his model girlfriend through a uh, through a bathroom door. It's his aunt. She is the first ever criminal profiler in South Africa, and they didn't really get one until the till the mid 1990s. We've had them here in the states for forever. She was a psychologist at a college who looked into the minds of serial killers. They brought her in, so it's an 11 episode series, and it starts with um, the first case she was ever involved in, called the uh, Station Strangler, where this serial killer murdered young boys, 22, mm. they believe. They wound up only convicting him of one, I guess, based off of the evidence. But she helped him and proceeded to help them with a lot of cases over the years. The woman who plays in it, you guys know her. Well, you'll know it, Jay, because you watch the show. Charlotte Hope from Game of Thrones. She played Miranda. Oh, all right. Okay. And she's really good. So the, the, the way I would describe this, it's almost like a police procedural. It's really good. You know, it's a dramatization of a true story. She's called it, I, I thought she said it right. It's more of a why done it than a who done it. So it's like why, you know, she right. goes into the why of these serial killers. So it, it's graphic. It's hard material. The first one, obviously, like I said, is young boys are being killed and That's tough. the yeah. police couldn't solve it. And and the, the people were losing. They were protesting literally at the police station because they couldn't figure out who was doing this. And she came in and helped them. Wow. Rhea, do you think she ever profiled her nephew? I, I thought about that. I was wondering about right. that because, you know, well, see, her thing was different. Her thing was serial. His killing was a spur of the moment. I think those are two different 
you know, that's a probably was, you know, who knows on something. Those are different. Serial killers are a real, it, it's a, she really gets into it. So it's real interesting. Where that, is it? And, it? and it really, and it really messed it messed with her life, her, her marriage, her personal life, because it's just so nasty. The stuff. got to see it. Where with. is it? It's on a Brit box by a prime. You get it off of the prime. Okay. And uh, Rhea, before we move off a of British segment, my wife wanted to let you know that on your recommendation, she started the crown. Uh, she had not been interested in that before, but she asked me what is the strongest recommendation that Rhea's ever had. And I said, I think it's probably the crown. I think that yeah. each episode of that is kind of like a Super Bowl for Rhea. And yeah. um, my wife is down that rabbit hole. So I, oh, I, good. I've i been watching with her. I can't say that the subject matter in, engages me, but it's well done. <laughs> it's well I got done. One it's other really thing. well done. Before we get off the British thing, Rhea, I yeah. have a request for you. I want to try something a little different. Um, it, it's a British show that I have seen, and okay. I don't want I, I I want your opinion before I form my own. It's on Netflix. It's a movie. It's an hour and a half. It's okay. called Scoop. Right? I, I almost watched it this weekend. What would you watch? And people yes. out there, you watch it on Netflix too. It's the story of how this network was able to get Prince Andrew to sit down and destroy his career and his legacy. I was going to watch it as well. I, I was, yeah. it, it's, it's great. I, I saw a lot of stuff great, on but that. I, I defer to Rhea on this stuff. She might find some, I don't know enough about this, you know, royal family stuff. I knew, I knew the whole thing when it yeah. happened. So I, I, yeah. I but I was, I had already started um, uh, Come Catch, uh, Catch yeah. a Killer. And I said, all right, I'll do that. So I will watch that either today or tomorrow and I will review it Beautiful. next week. My Next my week. wife, Ooh. as we as we watch The Crown, my wife keeps asking me questions like, who's this? Who's that? And I'm like, we fought a war, so I don't have to know who these people are, honey. Just as an FYI. Uh, all right, what do we got on the teen segment there, Rhea? Okay, teen is really fun. So, you know, my my son Clark goes to Roman Catholic now. This is after his entire life going to public school. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry I did not raise him religious. So we were having a discussion about him in theology class and that he just doesn't understand it. And I said, Let's, I said, there's a really great movie I think you'll like because it's a mystery, but it has to do with Catholicism, The Da Vinci Code. Ah. So he and I, on Saturday afternoon, watched The Da Vinci Code because I said, the Catholic Church hated that movie. They 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 hated the book. They hated the movie. I love the book. I think the book was a little better than the movie. But I don't think they watched the end of it where all this stuff happens where Tom Hanks discovers all this stuff. You know, it's a holy grail to search for what... They believe Jesus Christ had been married and had a kid. Um, but at the end of it, Tom Hanks really goes into that he still has faith. Right. And I thought that that was important to show Clark that you may not understand what they're trying to teach you in theology. I went to 12 years of Catholic school and I'm not real religious, but I do have faith. And I thought like that was a real cool thing that he did at the end. There's a great twist. On its basis, it's a great mystery thriller. Yeah. I was shocked Rotten Tomatoes Critics, 25%. Ooh, they did wow. not like it. Audience was better, almost 60%. But if you just took it for a mystery thriller, it was good. But it told some important lessons at the end of it, which was why. And Clark really liked it. He thought it was fun. Yeah, Where did you see it? Where was it? Uh, I, so you have to buy it. You have to purchase it. I think I got I got it on Apple. Three ninety nine. dollars okay. It was a yeah. huge hit at the time. And yeah, Rhea, I was raised very Catholic and I did yeah. not raise my children religious. Yeah. And they asked me questions about the Catholic church sometimes. <laughs> and you realize how weird some of the stuff is that we learned totally. when they start asking you a question, you go, oh, well, this is because of that. And they go, what are you what? talking yeah. about? And you go, oh, you know, when you're growing up with it, it doesn't seem so weird. <laughs> I gotta be honest. Yes. Uh, Angela, what do you got for us this week? Yes. Uh, before I give you a uh, pick in a pan this week, I just want to mention that uh, I have a new revamped, improved website angelocatali.com and i will be providing a one to two minute uh review of something every week on there the same day we do our podcast i'll kick it off this week with i'll give you my thoughts on whether i like curb your enthusiasm no <laughs> I'm I guessing. To... Spoiler alert! He likes it. We <laughs> <laughs> already ruined it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> picking a pan. Here's my pick, and and I think uh, this is another thing I think Rhea would really connect with. Um, it's on Max. It is in the process of rolling out. It's about halfway out. Five episodes. It's called Girls on the Bus. It's a female version of a terrific. Uh, 
a book uh, by Timothy Krauss in 1972, The Boys on the Bus. It basically gave you the inside workings of a political reporter's covering a presidential campaign. Oh, that's cool. And this updates it to women, including uh, an influencer. You know, it, it oh, cool. modernizes it. So you're seeing an influencer, you're seeing a conservative uh, broadcaster. They're all women. And, and the woman, the main role is played by, I had not seen her in anything. She was very popular, I guess, in Glee, Melissa Benoist. Oh my God, she is so good. She is beautiful and she is so likable. And it's a great story. I'm halfway through it and I'm totally hooked. I think it's a great story of how you cover a, you know, a, a, a campaign nowadays and how right. different it is and the interpersonal things that go on between the reporters who are competing with one another and uh, sleeping with people and all sorts of stuff. It's really good. Yeah, I can, really like can I just interrupt for one second to say, yeah. this is so up my alley. Yeah. And I'm so annoyed at the current state of television that I had no idea. It's five episodes in, and I didn't yeah. even know this was on no. the air. How is that possible? I was on the Mac site and I saw it. They haven't promoted it at all. No. That must be David Zaslav. Right? <laughs> Again. 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 Enemy of the right. podcast, David Zaslav. And here's, here's a total pan. Like, I watched one episode and you couldn't get me to watch it again. And it is a high budget Ripley, all right? Ripley on Netflix. Ripley is a amazingly stylish noir. Right. That takes okay. the movie, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which uh, starred Matt Damon and was two hours and 19 minutes, and takes a movie that was already accused of being too slow <laughs> and drags it out for over seven hours. Now, wow. the budget had to be huge. It shows you 1960s New York on old okay. subway systems, and then it takes you to 1960s Italy. And it's beautiful to watch. It is really well done. There's no story. Yeah. One episode in, it's problem. There's virtually no story. And you go, they're going to drag this out for seven hours? I'm done. Yeah. Ripley, no, don't watch it. <laughs> it stinks. It's it's okay to just do a movie, guys. You don't have to do a twelve hour TV series. You can just exactly. do a two hour movie sometimes. No. Uh, I have a review of the new movie by Dev Patel, written by Dev Patel, starring Dev Patel, yep. produced by Dev Patel and Jordan Peele, called Monkey Man. A uh, little bit of a history on this: it was produced during COVID for nine million dollars, sold wow. to Netflix. For thirty million, everybody made a bunch of money. Right. Netflix sat on it for three years because the political content is so uh, uh, rough against Modi in India, they, and they have a huge business in India, so they didn't want to release it. Jordan Peele, who you might know from Get Out and a whole bunch of yeah. stuff, saw it, convinced Universal to buy it for nine million. Wow. So they, they sold it at a huge loss and it came out this weekend, made 12 million at the box office. So it's already a hit. I'm going to tell you this. Dev Patel is a big time new action star and leading man. Uh, I know that there's a movement to get him as James Bond. I am for that. He would make a great James Bond. Um, the movie itself, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. I think he had some uh, early director issues with trying to do an arty action movie. Sometimes that works in, in the movie. Sometimes it doesn't. I'm just going to say this as an old man. I'm officially an old man. I went to go see it. And my son said, what'd you think? And I said, well, I'm going to wait till you go see it. What'd you think? And he came back and he said, it was great. Dad, what didn't you like about it? There were parts I couldn't see or hear. Don't make it so dark. I hate that. Don't make it oh. so low. I'm oh. telling you, everybody had an Indian accent. I wanted closed captioning so bad. I saw yeah. this in the movie theater. The screen was so dark. My son had zero problem with it because his eyes and ears still work. As a 47-year-old man, I'm sitting there going, I think I'm really liking this, but I can't tell because I can't yeah. see it. So I'm going to give it a six. That No, I'll give it a 7 out of 10 in the theater. My guess is it'll be a 9 out of 10 when you get it home and you can actually see and hear what's happening. But uh, Dev Patel, watch him. I give him more directing jobs and make him James Bond. Think outside the box, Broccoli's. Make him James Bond. I think he'd be <laughs> great. He looks fantastic as an action hero. That's in the movie theaters right now. I, I got to tell you, Jay, I'm glad you mentioned that you're pretty old, 47. 
That's way over the hill. You're a baby. You're a baby. Hey, I performed at a college last night, and no yeah. lie, a girl yeah. came up to me yeah. after the show and said, hey, I looked you up online. You used to be pretty hot. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you so much wow. for that, young lady. Oh, wow. Let me go drive into oncoming traffic while I contemplate what you just right. told me. Well, that's something I've never had to worry about, Jay, so I'm sorry to hear that for you. All right, let me go over. Uh, Doc, yes. if you would like to witness a TV masterpiece, <laughs> watch the final episode, 12 seasons, Curb Your Enthusiasm on Max. That is the highest recommendation I've ever given anything and probably the highest I'd ever give anything anyway. Rhea highly recommends Catch Me a Killer on Amazon Prime. If you want to pay a couple of bucks, she also says she enjoyed the Da Vinci Code on Apple TV. I'm suggesting, just because Rhea's going to review it next week, Scoop on Netflix. I uh, highly recommend Girls on the Bus on Max. And I don't recommend at all Ripley on Netflix. And Jay is in the middle, a six on Monkey Man, currently in theaters. Watch it when it comes out and get all the uh, dialogue that you can't get in the theaters. Guys, go to AngeloCatati.com right now. Buy Angelo's book if you haven't already, but also check out the video. There it is, Loud by Angelo Cataldi, available at AngeloCatati.com. <laughs> also, Amazon.com and Audible.com. Pick it up wherever you get your books and uh, check out his video review of Curb Your Enthusiasm. What's he going to say? Is he going to say it's good? It's going to be bad? Who knows? You have to go to AngeloCatati.com to figure it out. Uh, also, if you like the podcast, let somebody know about it. Uh, rate and review us. Spread the word. Special thanks to Jared Clapper, who does all our production work and social media. Guys, we got big stuff coming to the podcast soon. So we're growing. <laughs> Things are happening. Be on board. Let people know. And thanks for joining us. We will be back next week with more great TV content.